Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am thrilled to be able to share with you some poetry from a newly released Scars Publications book in honor of Tom Woodruff's open mics on the first Wednesday of every month called Community Poetry. And because I can't be there for it, I thought I'd be in a library like space for you guys. This is a set of poems I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you a nice big chunk of poems from the Donna Dirt January to April 2022 issue collection book titled The Ice That Was. The ice that was. What? What ice? Well, you know, it's becoming spring. So maybe it's no longer icy. I'm not sure. But The Ice That Was is the name of the collection book from Down in the Dirt magazine that is for the January to April 2022 issues. It's a really convenient way to put a bunch of issues into one large space if you want to collect large volumes. But I'm going to share with you a number of poems from one section of this book. I hope you appreciate them. Haha! -ha. I've already opened to the first one. Duh, because sometimes if there is short prose, there may be a little bit of room, but not enough for a piece of artwork. So we might fit a tiny, tiny poem, like a Twitter-length periodic table poem, which Scars Publications has released a collection book of all of them, Twitterverse periodic table poetry. And if there is, they would have the poem in there. And as you can see, there's a really tiny picture in here too. But I'm gonna see if I can find it in the larger screen to be able to share with you, and you can see it online. This first piece is called Lanthanum, the Shoulders of Giants. People seldom remember actors unless they take the lead. You forget supporting roles. They remain escaping notice. They lie hidden and use their accuracy, helping others to make everything strong. When you see them through that lens, your focus should suddenly sharpen on them. And I share that with you because, let me see if I can, aha, uh -huh. I've got it on a screen here. It's slightly larger, if I can find it right here, you go. Lanthan on the shoulders of giants. It's impossible to see, but I'm just showing it to you that there's this idea of these lenses, and there's actually bits of lamp on them in different formats inside of the lenses in this picture. And if you're having difficulty seeing it, especially if you're looking at it through a Facebook Live feed, hi, by the way, to everybody in the Facebook Live feed, but if you're having difficulty seeing it because it's not in color or if it's coming out so difficultly on a YouTube later video, you can always check out Lanthan on the Shoulders of Giants on Scars at TV with links to it, or if you find this book, The Ice It Was, through Scars at TV, there are links to the actual original image, which is not in black and white like in the book. So you can check it out there. I wanted to share that with you because I've got two of them that are in this one section I'm going to share with you with another image as well, and it is titled, Carbon May Have Killed the Dinosaurs After All. That big meteor that landed, that ended the reign of non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago, they figured mass extinction came from the carbonaceous chondrites from the asteroid belt's outer edge. All that carbon didn't reflect light until this dark impactor made life go dark on planet Earth. And once again, to show that idea to you, let's see if I can show it up on a larger screen here for you. It's just a bunch of toy images of dinosaurs that are on this thing, which is really hard to see on the Facebook Live feed. Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. But, as I said, if you wanted to look at this on Scarset TV um, for the book, The Ice That Was, or for their periodic table poem section, you can find this book, this picture in color, and see it a whole lot better than it's on the screen. But because I gave you two Twitter-length periodic table poems, and the second one was about carbon, I might as well share with you the periodic table poem for carbon, which also appears in this issue, in this collection book. It's called Carbon. I used to see the magazine ads and the TV commercials. All I was taught was that a big busted blonde was all I could aspire to be. So I would dye my hair. So I would act oh, like a dumb blonde. 
I would still beat them at any mind games, but men don't like the truth shoved in their faces because they refuse to believe that anything, that, to believe anything that doesn't actually stroke their ego. So, yeah, I was a carbon copy of what the media shoved down America's throats. And yeah, as time went on, this dark-haired woman started to gain some popularity back, and that they still thought that I have to be anorexically thin, and they still had, and they still had to battle the notion that all men still adoring the dumb blondes. And and yeah, as the years wore on, I didn't have to dye my hair, but I still had to be thin, and I still had to be a carbon copy of that dark-haired, gaunt, soulless faces that are plastered on billboards, papers, and screens. I pass the magazine stands, see carbon copies of these models on multiple magazine covers. I pass the media store with rows and stacks of repeated TV screens showing carbon copies to the world of what we are supposed to be. I don't want to be a carbon copy of anything. I want my own thoughts, my own ideas, and I want to spill them out for the entire world to read and hear. But carbon copy or not, I end up resigned knowing that despite our differences, we are all carbon-based life forms. I mean, when scientists look for life on other planets, they always only look for water first. Well, sure, hydrogen, oxygen, life as we know it needs it. I, I get it. But carbon-based life forms are all we know. I mean, whether or not they have arms or legs or gills or a mouth or a brain, they all have carbon in common. So when I see the atrocities mankind causes, when I see Adolf Hitler, <laughs> the vegetarian artist wannabe. When I see Adolf Hitler collect his cult followers to systematically slaughter millions. When I see the stacks of the skin and bone emaciation, stacks of bodies in dishes, ditches or, or in rooms stacked in a pyramid to a small hole for air in the ceiling after their final shower. When I see the Pope visit Cuba and wear a sombrero. When I see chickens crammed into rows of cages they cannot move in for, for their eggs, for their flesh. And when I see the rows of prepackaged, barely recognizable cow flesh wrapped in cellophane, row after row in the grocery store. This is one I have to remember, that despite everything, and as much as I hate to admit it, we are not all that different. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, we're all carbon-based life forms. All right, I'm closing this to be able to share with you. These are poems I'm sharing with you from the Down in the Dirt January to April 2022 issue collection book, The Ice That Was, from Scars Publications. And like a good little soldier on live Facebook streams, I should say hello to people that are tuning in to watch. Hi there. I'm reading these in honor of the Tom Woodruff Poetry Open Mic that would be on the first Wednesday of every month at Half Price Books, which is not going on right now. So I'm reading in honor of that in the space, which has a lot of books around. It, so it looks like a bookstore in a manner of speaking in my library space. Anywho, but I thought I'd share with you another block of poems from this book. This next one I was going to share with you is, oh, it's a love poem in a manner of speaking. This is titled Learning How Love Lasts. On Valentine's Day, four days before their wedding date, as only a little girl, I would see the box of chocolates dad brought from mom. Thinking about it, then and now, I thought this was just a box of generic holiday attempts at affection. Years later, as I finally compiled my family tree, now centuries old, I'd find occasional old photos of mom and dad. Wedding photos, black and white photos posing with friends, photos of them on a cruise, even meeting Rod Sterling when his TV show The Twilight Zone was at his peak. Once, as I was grown, moving on my own, I asked my mother if I could have some of these old 
cocktail dresses of hers, dresses she wore over the years with Dad. Absolutely gorgeous little black dresses you would see models wear back in the day on the runway. And she gave me a few of those dresses, but she also gave me a few pieces of her jewelry, including a gold ring with an ankh on it. After she explained to me that Dave gave her this ring and told her that the ankh, this ankh, was given as a symbol of everlasting life and is his everlasting love to her. My religious friend's family may have found issue with my wearing this pagan ring, but to me, the ring is only about love. And as in the necklace, my dad got my mom that I was thrilled with when she gave it to me. It, it, there was a single gold pendant on a gold chain, a disc the size of a silver dollar. And inscribed on it are his words written with words from Robert Browning's poem. Come, dear, grow old with me, the best is yet to be. I think of these things after she passed away and how I would spend time with Dad because he couldn't fathom spending a single night alone in their home without her. I even traveled with him for one of his weekend gambling trips because he couldn't fathom staying in a hotel alone. His son couldn't make it, so I'd be happy to join. Taking a break from watching him playing cards and pulling slot machines, I stepped outside to enjoy the sun by the water near the casino by the side entrance. And eventually a supervisor walked over to ask if I was okay. I then realized that she was concerned I may be feeling suicidal, standing here alone and staring at the water below instead of gambling, <laughs> because... I just may have lost everything while I was there. <laughs> it, it was a sweet concern from the casino, uh, as well as a good effort to cover the casino's bases. But there was no need to worry, and, and not now. I, I wasn't gambling. I, I'm just here to make my dad feel better, because his one love is no longer with him. I couldn't be with my dad when he passed away. But I was told that as he was approaching the end, his last words he said were that he couldn't wait to see her again. <laughs> I hope that thought, seeing her again, put him at peace when he closed his eyes that final time. pieces. What am I doing to you guys, right? These are pieces from the Down the Dirt collection book, The Ice That Was. The Ice That Was. I just want to sing that instead of, a, instead of reading the title. Um, but I'm going to find for you a few more poems in this collection for you. Aha, right there. Right there. Um, this next one I'm going to share with a total change of pace is titled Evil is Tricky. People have fought in wars, killed people, had to justify it in their minds. Women have been raped, then told it was the way they dressed to lure the lust. Then again, young women are sold for sex acts to insanely rich middle-aged men. People don't want to believe life is a delusion, but Evil is a dog that you think you'd recognize until, because evil is tricky, evil just hides in plain sight. People live day to day and then think that even though their life is day to day only nothingness, going through the motions, they think that life is generally good and that they're only missing out on the good life because they didn't take the right steps or make the right choices. And maybe it's only the select few who see that the difference between good and evil is paper thin, tissue thin, that maybe just a few can actually see that line, that paper thin line that they dance on it every day. 
Okay. Now that you've learned how tricky evil can be, because that was a poem titled Evil is Tricky, I thought I would share with you. And this one doesn't have an image, but in this book, there is a toy length poem, and it is toy length periodic table poem, and it's titled Barium Dateline. Dateline, Tennessee. A woman living on Lookout Mountain had a mysterious illness for months, then found out that her husband slash doctor had been poisoning her for five months, adding barium to her morning coffee. Insane. It's insane. Sorry. <laughs> it's just you hear these stories and you're like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm going to share with you one, two, three more poems from this Down in the Dirt issue collection book, The Ice That Was, The Ice That Was. And thank you all for watching, even on a Facebook live stream. You're double plus awesome. You guys are all so very. <laughs> Anywho, this next one I'm going to share with you is a fun one that I think I did at a show and I made a point to everybody to do a selfie in the show afterward because it totally fit in with this poem. This poem is called Popular and Useless. <laughs> A part of us wants to be famous. We want everyone to know us and love us. If I'm wrong, explain to me the selfie stick. But think about it. The most popular things, I mean more popular than people, are products. Coke, Harley, Kodak, Levi's, Nike, even... 7-Eleven. All these things are so much more known than you or me. All these things are so popular and they have no substance. So maybe the selfie stick makes sense. If we all want to be popular, if we all want to be famous, maybe we've learned how to take our cues for being perfect by being generic and having no substance at all. <laughs> so let's go and start the show. Time to turn your camera toward yourself. Open your eyes wide, but don't smile too hard because you can want to be wrinkle free and post that perfect picture on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest to show everyone how on the surface you're picture perfect. <laughs> Don't bother looking for anything under the surface. Just inject botulism into your face so you can't even show expressions because nothing's too far for surface beauty. <laughs> you want to be known? Then focus on your outside and don't worry about what's inside at all. <laughs> it was fun to do. I think I read that in Austin. And I turned around, I'm like, let's do a selfie. And I did one in Chicago in a show. And everybody did selfies. And it was with Popular and Useless, which appears in this book. And following that is another Twitter length poem. And for Twitter length periodic table poems, we'd often release them with Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook images. And this one has one. It's really, really tiny. It's next to impossible to see on the Facebook live feed or on the video on the YouTube feeds. And it's in black and white and tiny on this uh, in this book, but if you want to see, you can see it at Scars at TV. You can see a color picture that is so much bigger. But this one is actually for gold. And A U are the letters for gold and the periodic table. Anywho, this is titled Gold for the Foolish at Heart. Fool's gold in the gold rush was only pyrite. They then learned gold hides in iron disulfide, either in particles or as an alloy. Now they pull gold atoms from pyrite crystal. <laughs> and I think, who's the fool? One with fool's gold? Or the one bent on destruction and wanting something more? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I know it's really hard to see in the Facebook live feed, but I've tried to put it into a large screen, which means you can't see it. You can't see it. It's really difficult to see. It's in black and white in the Facebook live feed, and on YouTube streams, you'll see an image of an image, and even though it's in color, it's so out of, distorted and out of focus. So if you go to Scars.tv and do a search for Gold for the Foolish at Heart, enough words that you'll be able to find at Scars at TV. Or if you go to the Down in the Dirt book, The Ice That Was, January for April 2022 issue collection book, ta-da! 
you can find it there in the links and you can see the color image nice and huge there for you. But now I'm going to share with you the last poem. Haha, -ha. Zenotro, it's not ricotta. A humorous one, I guess. An interesting piece for the end of the book for you. I hope you guys enjoy it. This is called Zenotro, it's not ricotta. Doctors found a large ovarian cyst in a friend of mine still in her early 20s. She was scheduled for surgery to remove it. So the weekend before, I thought she needed a pick-me-up to get her to get away and she needed a pick-me-up. So we flew to DC and stayed with my friend. Now, my friend worked on the hill. He didn't know my girlfriend, so he just gave us keys so we'd be on our own. So we saw the Smithsonian, we toured the town, took buses from one place to the next. Now, when this city girl got to DC, got on the Stacy bus and sat down, I thought that we'd have a moment of peace, you know, until a disheveled older black man walked right over to us to talk. And the first thing out of his head was that this guy was homeless. It's the first thing I thought, you know, but I'm trapped here with him on this bus. I, how do I avoid him asking for money? But there was no escaping him, and he just looked right at us, right into our eyes, and said, Can you help me? And I didn't want to answer. I, I was out of my element. And he pulled out a newspaper, crinkled up in his grasp, and he said, I'm doing this crossword here, and they, they want a, no, a seven-letter word for cheese. There's an O and a T but they're in the wrong spot. It's a kind of cheese. It's not ricotta. Can you think of any other kind of cheese? No, I don't do crossword puzzles, but I couldn't even think. And I think my friend was a little too concerned for her own safety. So we both just said, no. And he said, thanks, and turned to ask someone else on the bus. And he kept repeating it. It's a kind of cheese. It's seven letters. It's not ricotta. And so we turned back to staring out the large glass uh, panels on the bus, trying to soak everything in that we could, though we could still hear the din of people talking and the disheveled man asking strangers about this crossword clue. I think I looked over to see him accosting another woman with his forwardness, but when he stopped asking, she looked down and she meekly said, Cottage? And that's when this disheveled man turned into this bombastic, boisterous behemoth. He was thrilled with this one word that he needed. Cottage! Cottage! It's cottage! Thank you! <laughs> and just then the bus slowed down to a stop. And the man kept repeating the words as he got off the bus. Cottage! A seven-letter word for cheese! Cottage! <laughs> and as I even watched him walk down the street as our bus pulled away, I was seeing such new animation in this old man's step. <laughs> it was the funniest thing to see. And when you didn't know what's going on, you're like, what? I don't understand. Cottage is a kind of cheese, and this man screaming about it, and it was just so funny. And anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this was a nice, hefty reading for you guys during the 1 to 3 p.m. time frame, which was the usual time I would meet up at Half Price Books at North Lamar in uh, North Austin for Tom Woodruff's monthly poetry reading on the first Wednesday of every month. Because that's not going on, I was doing this reading in this time in or honor of that space. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching live for checking out a later YouTube video release and thank you um, thank you for being creative being poetically inclined if that's how you're so inclined uh, thank you for staying safe if you have the chance to be vaccinated and you haven't been vaccinated then go get vaccinated so us automatons can all get out in the world again and act like everything's back to normal um, if in any of everything that you do, please remain safe. 
Um, we still are learning to stay apart from each other when we're in lines places. We're learning our lessons slowly but surely. But thank you all so very much for everything. I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, keep up the good work. Keep up the good spirits. And I look forward to seeing each and every one of you very, very soon. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are the best. Thanks.